So one of the things is, would you describe death and sickness as autobiographical fiction? And if so, where do you think the divide between biography and fiction is? Yeah, I, I think of it as um, a work of autofiction. Um, autofiction is uh, mostly applied to literature. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, a kind of form that has been popularized, I'd say, in the last five years. I've become more aware of it through my peers. Um, Sheila Hetty's mm -hmm. book, um, How, How Should a Person Be, and a, a Motherhood, a recent book, are both works of autofiction. So surely um, uh, imp uh, inspired by life, uh, even naming people from her life. But then also taking on artistic um, tangents into imagination. Uh, Jordan Tannehill is also another person who's a friend of mine who works in the realm of autofiction. Um, and it, my background is I do many things. Um, I tell stories in so many different forms from music to film to broadcasting. I feel that my broadcasting work is very much an artistic discipline. I view it as such, uh, visual arts, salsa, dance, um, and much of my work within the realm of broadcasting was documentary work. And there is something very, very visceral and real and amazing. We can never, the most incredible things happen in life. And our imaginations um, can't, can't confabulate such things. And I know in my own life, just extraordinary, meeting people through my documentary work, being inspired by their stories. I spent a lot of days for years, uh, every week plunking myself down on a street corner and um, introducing myself to people and seeing if they would open up. And many of the times they did. And what they shared for me from their lives was extraordinary. And I did my best to um, be able to uh, give a platform for those stories. And so I know how visceral and, and deep those, um, those, those places are for all of us. And certainly in the last couple of years, um, the last couple of years have been very challenging for me and for everyone, this, this lockdown and pandemic, this year of losing everything of which we knew and having to go with and embrace that which was full of upheaval while, while the world seemed to be exploding around us environmentally, politically. Uh, so it's been a very challenging time. It's a very um, inspirational time as well. Um, so uh, I think to answer your question, uh, the, 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 you know, it, um, I think a, most of my work has been derived, even when it seems completely fantastical, even when I make no mention of anybody in my real life, it's always been inspired by an event from my life. Um, and so, but something like my last movie, which was a supernatural ghost story, was inspired by an encounter that I had in Barcelona with a literary ghost, a poet, whose house I was staying in. And we became fast friends, albeit in the beginning, he really didn't like the fact that I was in his place. This was a really incredible um, experience in my life. And I knew that it would have to come out in a story of some sort. So I, I made Octavio is dead, but that is a work I would say of fiction um, based upon um, an original inspiration. Um, and then uh, my documentary work uh, is, is uh, oral storytelling most of all. And I would say that that was documentary, but even then, you know, when, when you're gleaning the stories of people and they're recounting it in a kind of oral tradition, you know, we, ha we take ebbs and flows and, and, and um, remember uh, things that happened to us in a kind of storytelling manner. So, you know, I, I think of um, 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 Farley Mowat, you know, mm -hmm. a, a guy who was a, a person who wrote from life, but then people were like, you're lying. <laughs> and he was like, um, you know, he's like something like, don't hold me to the truth. Um, so, something like, I, I, so don't hold me to the truth of the events, but I know the truth of what happened. Something like that, you know. The so, I mean, it's always a slippery slope. Um, and then uh, with my with death and sickness, it is definitely a work of autofiction. Um, very much so, uh, recounting um, losing my partner and beloved person in my life, Adam Litovitz, who was such a huge part of my life for twelve years. We were. Uh, co-collaborators uh, and partners and he was my best friend and his passing um 
that happened a year before the lockdown was uh, it threw my world for a, a, a wrench in my life like no other. It was uh, is in, and continues to be a, uh, very challenging to to live in the absence of him. Um, and then the the uh, the pandemic striking, which by comparison really felt like a cakewalk. Um, but then also um, in in my um, kind of in the aftermath of trying to figure out how to live life without Adam, one of my best friends, Sarah, she's a karaoke queen. And she was always been, she's always there, such a good friend to work, talk to, and she's very funny and great. And she's a karaoke singer. I myself hate karaoke because I'm Chinese and my parents and my dad and my stepmom, they take karaoke very seriously. So I always was, I always had this like, um, I felt pressure to karaoke in the basement to their jumbotron, but I wanted to go and support Sarah. And so I watched her. And I, at that night at the karaoke bar, behind the bar, I met Dylan who was working at Handlebar. Um, and he was a person who was going through intense life difficulties, very different from my own, but nonetheless hardships. And um, we became friends and supporters of one another. And when the lockdown happened, I was in, um, Detroit and Windsor and he was on his way to play South by Southwest with his band Hot Garbage when everything struck you know uh, and he had to cancel and turn back I had to go back um, and I had been asked to to uh, contribute a, a short film to a lockdown anthology of very many people um, having 10 minutes to talk about the lockdown life and I was really interested in that idea, but I couldn't just do it in a, such a small thing. I felt like I, I needed a larger canvas and I, I wasn't able to deliver it within the timeline that, um, that was asked. So I had to pass on that. But it got me thinking about what I would do. And um, when, the, when the pandemic hit, I suggested to Dylan, um, well, I think this is gonna go for quite a long time and it's best that we have support so what what do you say we um locked down together and we we're pretty we were we didn't know each other terribly well but we liked each other a whole lot and i said let's make a movie and um he was like okay and then he showed up with like his keyboards and uh, a day later i said could you put all your clothes and carry your keyboards again as you did and i'll film you and um and he said, the only thing he said was like, sure, but can I not put my keyboards in there? Cause they're really heavy. Can I fill them with pillows? And I'm like, okay. Um, and so, so this uh, movie was very much about a kind of experiment to see what would unfold, what we, what could we create? What was the narrative? I knew that I wanted to, 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 to reflect our experiences. I didn't know what was going to happen. And we sort of, unlike the other movies that I've made, um, we kind of, it, it, it came together as, as we came together. Right. Yeah. Well, that was actually goes into my next question, which was, is really about process. Because as I was watching it, I, I was thinking a lot about that. You know, what was planned versus improvised? Like, for instance, did you wake up one morning and say, oh, today we're gonna make a Victorian vignette with puppets, you know? <laughs> I, which I loved, uh, by the way. Um, so yeah, how much was written, how much was planned and how did you guys uh, work together? I mean, obviously there's amazing chemistry and I think you, you work together well, but yeah, I, I, when I was watching and I did think a lot about like, you know, did you spend all day playing? Was there a lot of play and improvisation and how much did you sit down and write in advance and just yes. how that working process was? So, so this was so different from my other movies. Other movies are very, um, you know, by the book style where you spend years honing a script um, and it's years of development and then finally get you know land hopefully financing and it's a big production and you have only like Octavio is dead I shot in 17 days not a lot so I really had to go in there like with knowing every single shot knowing that I could only have two takes with the actors, knowing exactly what it was, leaving room for improv, you know, improvisation within the acting, but knowing, having a very um, deep uh, and detailed blueprint. This one was very different. Um, 
it could not have been more different. Uh, it, it was um, not financed, it's self-financed. Um, but it was, it, I, I knew it needed a structure. Um, like every work I have experienced um, so far, even in improvisational music, will have a basic structure and then improvise within that structure. And, and it's that combination of structure and form that brings it to life. So I, I've never completely gone away from um, a destructured a destructured or completely improvised thing. So in this case, what had happened was, um, uh, there was the premise. There was the premise. Um, I knew that like my home is a very, this place here is a, it's only 11 feet wide, but it's a very special place. And it's a very special place because it houses the creative work of three amazing people in my life. My sister, my little sister, Dee Dee, Adam, and his mom, Malka, Malka Litovitz, she was a beautiful poet. I never had the opportunity to meet Malka because she passed before I met Adam, but she's a very um, big figure in our lives um, and a beautiful poet. My sister, uh, she passed away when we were, when she was a teenager and she was also a wonderful poet. And so I, my home houses a creative writing of the three of them. And I knew that I wanted in some way, shape or form to be able to share some of their profound insight and wisdom in their work. Um, and then also tell the story of Dylan and I. And then also in the kind of like lockdown world, when the world is kind of crumbling around you, the um, discovery that we can always escape uh, through our imaginations and create worlds of our own design. So when you say, well, you know, okay, you, you time traveled, <laughs> you know, you time traveled to the Middle Ages and uh, there was a crazy puppet show. Um, we, we made an intergalactic black hole, a, a, a void we called it, where it, suddenly it becomes very sci-fi. So that idea that it's a very radical idea of, um, um, you know, um, creating your own world. And that can be seen, um, within a, a political context, um, when you weary of all the politics outside in the world and you wish to define yourself in your own right. Um, there is one feminist that I love, Mary Timoney, who made a bunch of albums and then one album she was just like, okay, I'm a feminist and now I radically decide to create my own world. And she created this super fantastical world of song and, and created her own um, yeah, fantasy world. And I thought that was such a, a radical action. Um, and I loved that so much. So I knew that there were kind of these monikers that we were gonna do. And it began with um, um, one morning I woke up and I shot the first scene. And that was just set up the shot. <laughs> this was a really weird thing too, because there, the only, it was a casting crew of two people. So I would set up, uh, that morning I set up a shot and that was the day where I began kind of uh, preparing my house for the arrival of Dylan and have a moment with um, a plant that is a rose bush that is symbolic of Adam in my backyard, given um, to me by Jennifer Castle, the songwriter. And um, that sort of set things in motion. And then gleaning um, moments from encounters and ex uh, exchanges between Dylan and I started to proliferate there. And um, I, I sort of, um, I introduced this premise to Dylan and he was like, okay, um, so long as it's funny. <laughs> so he had, you know, his things, that, you know, it, it, it had to be funny, you know, couldn't be dour. Um, and it, he, you know, uh, there were th certain, certain things that he that, that were important to him. And it was like, okay, got it, yes. Um, and so we um, pretty much went into the office and hammered out in um, probably about four days, we worked pretty fast. It's one of those pieces that just galvanized quickly. We hammered out the treatment, the arc of the entire story. We hammered out every single scene we knew that we were going to travel to the Middle Ages. We knew all those things. So we were able to arc, arc, arc out um, a sequence of uh, scenes. And so then what I would do is I would take that, that, that uh, first one and then write, a, write the script to that scene. And then I'd pass it to him to see what he thought. And then he would 
um, have suggestions and we would tweak based upon his suggestions until we were both happy with it. And then we shot it. So then once we had a scene, then we shot it. It was precarious in the beginning because I mean, I'm in radio and I should know better to, of, of how to place mics, but I put it down haphazardly and the audio was terrible. The audio, all you could hear was the furnace because it was a very loud furnace and a very old furnace on its last legs. Um, and I listened, I was like, oh my God, all I hear is So I was like, hmm, artists are problem solvers. I was like, let's start the movie with a close up of the furnace, making that unearthly sound. So it's almost like in the depths of the basement, almost like an, a character because the house, Dylan also said, the house is so extraordinary, let's give the house a character. So it was like, okay, in case people are wondering what that sound is, we'll just start with the furnace. Um, but then of course we did redo the, um, we did redo the audio that was better and over ended up overdubbing. So we watched the scene and overdubbed our, our exchanges. Uh, and um, so uh, there were some learning curves in the beginning you know, I should, I, I now understand axis a lot better, um, dialogue axis. And, and um, you know, uh, I think through this process, we really honed our methodology. Um, so yeah, we would uh, shoot it. And then after that, I would edit it. Uh, he would go downstairs and start scoring the music. We both made the score as well. And then once that was all together, it, we, and we shot in sequence. So we're like, okay, and now we go here. And then so we prep for the next scene, prep the space, um, rehearsed. Uh, I, I, wrote, or I wrote the scene, you know, went through that same process again for each of those episodes. So it kind of was this um, boop, 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 boop. It's really interesting that you edited as you went. I find that because that usually isn't the case so that's 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 quite interesting so you can you know see what you had exactly i had to yeah because then um we would know if something was missing and if we needed to reshoot anything it's very helpful and also dylan has never made a movie before and nor has he acted okay. but he's real smart and he's real funny he's very funny. very and he has kind of like i've worked with um pro actors and non-actors and invariably, when you mix the two, the non-actors kick the pro-actors' butts because the pro-actors are acting. You know, they know their angles and stuff like that. And you can feel the acting, whereas the non-actors, and often children are the same way. They're just sort of responding in a very authentic way. So in the beginning, I'm watching these scenes. I'm like, damn you, you're kicking my butt in the scenes. Um, and, uh, you know, he really, he, he really demanded that I am present and, and real in, in these scenes because he was so much so in that regard. So um, there was a kind of great quality of his um, non-professionalism and uncaring about this this whole process and inability to, if, if anything, he's kind of one of the stubborn people, so stubborn actors, if something feels wrong, he's, there's no way you're gonna, you're gonna convince him to do anything. So it really, um, it, it lent a, a great deal of rigor to the process. Um, and, um, yeah, so we're, we're, we're pretty much learning as we went. And, and I think that that, um, shooting in sequence helped him and me because then we understand, you know, then you understand where we're going. You're living the experience. And it creates a structure. Yes. Yeah. And I mean, movies are shot oftentimes out of sequence for, uh, economic reasons, but for actors, it really is really very helpful to shoot in sequence so you get the flow of the story, especially for a non-actor who's not used to like jumbling it all up to, you know, jumbling it all. Most professional actors will look at their scripts and they have, they've reduced it and you've, they've got, you know, tons of notes on the side and they know all their, their jazz that they're doing from all their techniques they've learned. You know, a non-actor that if you just throw it like, oh, okay, we're gonna do the scene that happens like two weeks from this moment. But what? So I think it just lends a logical feeling. Mm -hmm. um, so there wasn't a whole lot of improvisation. I guess within the within the scenes, there was improvisation. Um, 
sometimes in the moments where there's no dialogue, it's a quite, quite a spare movie. There's not a whole lot of dialogue. So oh. much of the uh, non-verbal scenes are, they're, they're improvised as well. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of magic and wonder in the ordinary, you know, like before you talked about, one of my questions is about the house being character, you know, the creepy basement, um, you know, the shower, um, but also like, it's amazing how, you know, chopping onions becomes a motive, the quilt on the bed, you know, the art, uh, you know, all of those things take on different meaning and different layers. And I, I just found that really extraordinarily beautiful. Um, I mean, isn't that, isn't that something, you know, like we call, I think it's called mise-en-scene. And so, you know, that the idea that everything counts in a shot, every detail, what I'm looking at you, your choice of attire, the, the lamp hanging in the distance from the ceiling, everything says something and is imbibed with something. And so this place, you're right, you know, that, 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 blanket was given to me by um, a Cree Nation group in in, uh, in Winnipeg when I shot the Jack Layden biopic. Um, I acted in the role of um, Olivia Chow and there was a very intense, um, uh, Jack was really a great um, supporter and proponent of uh, Native autonomy and, and, and Native concerns uh, and a big ally. And so there was a very moving um, you know, ceremony of which we were bestowed these, these beautiful star blankets. And that, that star blanket is what you see on my bed. Um, Eric, uh, Eric, my friend, Eric Garcia he, Gomez, he painted uh, the painting above the bed, which is a picture, a painting of his, his uh, grandmother, who is the medicine woman of his, of his, um, of her village, um, who uh, uh, performed incredible feats like um she was self-taught and he tells me things where you know she there was a guy who just fell asleep drunk and with his hand in the fire and he woke up and his hand was burnt to a crisp <laughs> he went went to his grandmother who was like self-taught and, and put together this paste and put it on his thing and he grew back like she was like so revered in her community and she used very unorthodox things. It wasn't all natural stuff too. I think she, you know, put some craft dinner and stuff into some of her potions. Um, and um, so she is over in my bed and she's such a incredible person. And then seeing, you know, my sister, Didi and seeing um, Malka's work and Adam's work, their actual writing. I, I think it conveys something that is beyond even the story of which we're telling It's something is being, um, absorbed by sensitive people like yourself, you know, who are feeling those, those elements. Well, I find it really hard actually at times because it, you know, it's so emotive. Um, you know, I felt like, you know, you're putting your hand down in your stomach and like just pulling everything out, you know, you're there's like this kind of deep emotive excavation that's happening. And, you know, when you're watching, you know, videos of Adam and you're watching his, uh, you know, le reading his, his letters and notes and, and your sister as well, I, you know, I, I found it really hard. It's really beautiful. And I, you know, was that hard for you to do what that journey of, of going there? Yes, it, it is. and continues to be, um, you know, I, I, somebody asked me, uh, something like, um, was it healing? And in, in, in their way it is, um, but it also is life and it never goes away. The missing never goes away, um, the heartbreak, but the inspiration and their, um, it's hard to, to describe. I mean, I'm a, a spiritual person. I don't, um, that's where we're different as well. Dylan is like, he's an yeah, atheist. Yeah, he said that. That's one of my questions I was going to get into was about spirituality because it's such a big presence in, in the film. And when he yeah. said that as well. Um, so I feel there are um, spirits with me and guiding me that they, um, in a weird way, like um, it's so hard to even de describe in words. Um, sometimes I, um, sometimes I, when I get it caught up in words, I, have, I do find myself often talking to Adam and, and, and expressing how much I miss him. And there is sometimes, some days it gets very rough. It just, no, it's not like it vanishes, especially if you make a work of art that is deeply moving for oneself. Um, it, it doesn't mean it's a, 
it's just suddenly gone. Um, that that is part of life, and these are these are our life um, challenges that everybody goes through. We 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 wear these uh, difficulties, and and you know he comes to me in dreams, and um, and I feel his presence in nonverbal ways. It's not like he's like hey, you know. Um, there, there was a moment the other day where I was really attaching myself to the words and I suddenly felt this feeling like just let go of the words and feel my presence here. Actually, when you get all fre freaked out, like I miss you so much, you're actually convincing yourself of something wrong and it's pushing you this way to think of you know something very sad. But if you push all those words aside, just be quiet for a second, Sukyin, and feel my presence around you now. And, and th that... I was able to get to that place and, and I felt much better in that moment. I feel like you create this kind of otherworldly magic and wonder through the visual. Um, and sometimes there's words and sometimes there's often many moments where there's no words um, and it's just images. And like one of my favorite scenes is when you're dancing you know, and with, I don't know if you set up what you set up or tinfoil or something, but it's just, it's so one like free. Oh, it's just so beautiful. It's such a lovely moment. Yeah. That's, uh, that's a, that's a moment with my sister who hmm. could, like, um, I encounter her in another realm. She's a different, uh, non-corporeal being with lights, diamond lights coming from her eyes and the hood, you know, I, I, perform both parts and there's many scenes that we're, uh, we're acting multiple roles, um, sometimes by, you know, only showing limbs or, or what have you. But in this case, um, I, I wore Didi, uh, Didi is a, uh, she's just such a inspiring person. She was, um, uh, there are four da daughters and she was really, um, she was very tough. She was a uh, pretty gutsy person. She was like, you know, my mom was really tough and Didi could go toe to toe with my mom and, and even smoke in her face. Yeah. Well, I was like hiding and stuff like that. <laughs> um, and she, Didi had a much more kind of like, she had a kind of street feel to her. And so embodying her was really cool. Um, I, I feel like I, in some weird way, it's sort of um, conducting her. Uh, but th that moment where, you know, it begins with us so happy to see one another. But then also her, much of her work her diary that she gave me and left me when she passed um, is really the diary of a young teenager who is, um, I feel like, you know, there is nothing better than teenagers who are kind of not accepted by the adult world and not children. They are very engaged and present and honest and truthful and going through hard stuff. And she posed so many difficult questions with wonder and curiosity and presence in her journals um, at the beginning of that scene it's joy that we see each other but then it gets more um kind of uh well it goes from joy to suddenly this weird music and then she it, we're kind of like well what do we do now and she's just like let's dance and it was like so freeing to just like be in this otherworldly disco and dance with her and then stopping that dance in a, in a beat and, and following that up with her profoundly challenging questions that are universal, asked by a teen who was confused and, and so, so um, engaged. And to me, um, it's a, it, that passage is so beautiful and so strong. So trying to find... Um, trying to find the essence of each of Malka, Adam, and Didi in aspects of their writing and sort of give, you know, um, depict them in the way that is uh, accurate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I found, I found all of that extremely beautiful um, and, and very, very moving. Um, the neat thing is like this was uh, completely um, done outside of, um, you know, the structure of telefilm and so forth like that, financing. Mm -hmm. So there was a great deal of liberty. I feel in a lot of ways, it returned me back to storytelling and why it is that I like telling stories in sequential um, images. Um, it gave me a, an abundance of freedom to, to make this thing um, without any notes, without any this or that, 
really just up to us. In the end, um, we presented the cut to two very trusted friends with very good taste. And they gave us some notes that were very helpful in terms of like losing certain things that were unnecessary. Um, and, uh, but other than that, really self-driven and self-made like movies require a lot of working together with big teams which is really fun but you know the oftentimes the um the strongest films are those are that sort of come from a very uh, direct place so it's a person who writes and directs perhaps an uh, auteur who's able to communicate what they want to a to a team who take who, who hopefully they've cast the, the teammates that understand their vision and can elevate that vision, you know? So that's, that can happen in, a, in these big constructs. But this I liked because it was very low budget and it really, uh, it was very, a, very much a DIY effort. Mm -hmm. And it was like not having notes and just responding to our own curiosities and instincts and playfulness um, really was so beautiful, you know? And I think it creates a, a real sense of intimacy and authenticity that is incredibly beautiful and that really lures you in and captures you. Like you just feel, in, uh, you know, at the times I was crying, like I just like felt like I was inside something so personal, you know? And We're I inside something very personal and it's like the womb of a house and then the psyche because it's almost like in this strange lockdown, you're kind of just like, not just, in your house, but in the house of your mind and your brain and your body. And what happens when you're in there? Holy sheesh, these things can get kind of kind of intense. Um, and then also realizing the movie in ways that are innovative. Like uh, there is a, Dylan really wanted, cause he came from it so different. Like he came from it as a blue collar guy, working guy with two jobs, a musician, working musician, um, and suddenly this lockdown happened and he's like, oh God, he doesn't have to work, go, go work. It's kind of like, whew, kind of almost like this, this, this awesome, he was like, it was almost like this great exotic vacation. And he's like, I want a beach scene. I want a beach scene where I'm like, you know, in his fantasy life having, you know, having this great thing. And he was like, maybe we could shoot it at a beach. And I'm like, oh geez, you know, like, We'd have to bring all the, the sand, the sand will get in the equipment. It's a long way to get to a beach. I'm like, okay, I think I can get this beach thing down without leaving the house. Because part of our rules were like, you know, shoot in the house. If we went on forays outside, it would be shot on the cell phone, not on, a, on the good Canon cameras. But I set up a situation in the backyard and got it tight enough where it was just him and a kind of like, um, leopard blanket <laughs> behind him and um, I found um, online kind of um, uh, public domain images uh, that were very ancient <laughs> of, of beachgoers you know and um, bathing beauties you know from back in the day and uh, it, it was very much uh, we saw Christopher Marker's La Jete and that is an incredible movie it's a sci-fi movie all done with photographic stills and um, so watching movies that have been rendered in innovative fashions um, uh, were, were, it was like we, we go Christopher Marker on this so it was like we understand he's on a beach because then I cut away to you know he looks over there and tosses his hair and then we see a beach scene so it was there all kinds of neat ways that you can um, convey something uh, I find that scene interesting because it starts off really joyful yeah. and then it does this turn where you, you know there's this noise and it's like this anxiety and it happens so quickly yeah he's like ah this idyllic piece he becomes a nightmare yeah and then we realize it's because in real life he's been intruded on by my character gonging a big yeah. gong you know and do, doing a buddhist ritual which he finds incredibly annoying well, I, I, you know what, it's interesting that you mentioned ritual, because I think ritual is also 
in there as well. And I don't know if ritual is just something that became amplified because of the pandemic, but in the beginning, you know, it's the spraying of the, the groceries and washing everything down. Yes. You know, beautiful way that Dylan puts his mask because it's a layer of masks. Yeah. Also, you know, like that's a really lovely scene watching him do that. And then when he comes in the house and, you know, takes off his clothes and puts it in the laundry. And so you, you and then there's also, you know, elements that are echoed at the beginning and the end, like the shower. So it does have this kind of ritual in it in terms of the way that it's been put together. Yeah, it was, it was important to do that. So it was really, we really, um, really visualized uh, the, the scenes, but also looked at really iconic moments, some, you know, very um, important things that might seem throwaway at the time, you know. Um, but you can't just, I, I feel like uh, you can't just throw something in there and not kind of bring it back. So even like things like uh, um, the gun or a rose or uh, moments where uh, a, a something, an object um, is turned on its head and it, it, it is reintroduced later on, in a whole different kind of meaning. It gives a whole new kind of understanding of what that is. Um, so, so yeah, I, I think... Um, those little kind of finding those moments, seizing upon those moments, because it's like you can go scattershot and, and it can be maybe overwhelming and go every, every, I mean, it's, it's an art, this is an art movie, but hopefully a one that you can watch and kind of feel like you got at the end. So I think it's important to bring, sort of bring, bring totemic symbols or objects or moments back in a new way to give the, you know, audience something, something to think about. I think it's really layered and it resonates on different levels. So I think it's a piece that you can go back to again and again and, and feel different feelings and see new things. Like it's, there's so much there. It's just so full and it's really wonderful that way. It's super cool too. Cause like, um, it was very immediate, you know, I edit something. Oh, geez, we need this. Just fire up the camera and do it. You know, not a big song and dance to like, it's just like so immediate. It's almost like you could just grab, like you're playing, uh, making a sculpture. So that was really so fresh to feel like you could, um, you could follow your your inspiration. You could you could cook. It was like cooking in a kitchen. And you can see immediately what's working and what's not, which yeah. is is also great. Yeah. You kind of have this, you know, liberation of being able to go, okay, I didn't get that quite the way I want it, but now I can. And you don't have to worry about like, you know, people waiting around or, you know, that you're on a strict schedule. Yeah, uh, uh, you know, it's, um, it, 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 it was rendered on um, all, all consumer cameras and it looks great. Like I have a Osmo Steadicam that I uh, um, use for my documentary filmmaking and it's a seamless, beautiful picture. Uh, and my Canon cameras, gorgeous cameras. And then with the cell phone camera, they were intentionally used to have a more degraded feeling when we went into you know, the outside world. When you go out into the outside world, it gets a bit more handheld and has a bit more, um, um, not as a perfect picture. Uh, so these tools are at our disposal, which is really neat. And they're not expensive tools. And to be honest, I, I edited the whole movie on iMovie. Um, which is your basic program that every Mac computer comes with. Um, and uh, you did a great I, job on the editing, by the way. I noticed at the end that you did it, and I was like, wow, so you're, you're an amazing editor. It was, I oh, thought it was edited really, really well. Editing is super key. I think um, the story, you could give the raw material to 10 different people and you have 10 different edits, but maybe one of them will be really, really one will be clearly the better. Um, but, you know, iMovie, it became a little bit, problematic for me because um I could like when I had the movie it when it started to becoming over 70 minutes long the file was just too big my computer's old and it wouldn't export and so every moment that I would go there it, and it would crash and I couldn't export it was like so harrowing I think that was the most tense that I've been um and 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 then one day it just it just wouldn't export at all and I was freaked out and I went on reddit and I was trying to figure out what and then it was like ne people were like never make a movie longer than 10 minutes on iMovie it's not built for anything longer and I'm like oh great and I'm thinking all my stuff is in here I've edited the whole thing what if I I could destroy the whole movie by accident 
So um, then I found this one um, Reddit thread that was like, you guys, like, cursor through every single frame of your movie. If you come across even one black frame, that means that your footage has been compromised. You have to delete that section and import something else in. If you can imagine 28 frames per second, cursoring through a 80 minute movie, trying to find a black frame. Well, I did two of them. Oh, no, no. And then I took those out and imported a new one and then it exported. So it, that, I think I grew several gray hairs <laughs> during that process and that was not fun at all. Um, and now I, I just bought a new computer. Okay. <laughs> with lots of with lots of storage and backup. Yes. I hope. Yeah. That's always that's always key. Um, just, I still have a bunch more things I want to talk to you about. Yeah. Um, so one of the things I I'm wondering about is because you talked about how you and Dylan were practically strangers when you decided to quarantine together, and you do have this wonderful chemistry where you play off each other, and I think one of my favorite elements of the film is, is, is the humor um, because it's, it's really challenging. You're, you're exploring really emotive, difficult things um, and humor kind of, you know, lifts you out of there and takes you out of, out of there. And I, I think that's one of the things that makes the piece really successful. But my question is, what is one of the most profound things that you learned about each other in the process of making this? Well, let's see. Um... I feel like I feel like Dylan and I are extremely complimentary. I enjoy what he puts on in the morning when he play when we play music. At the same and and we have very similar world views, um, but he's much more chill than I am. Um, I, I tend to like be a worry wart, and he's just kind of like, well, kind of let it be. You know, I'll be like, boop, boop, like right away, like hey, you know, like I'll be like very on top of it like hey do you want to see this and he'd be like i i need to he's like do you see this coffee there's no thing i can do until this it, the coffee goes below this level you know on the level of this giant mug um so he's he has more of a kind of i i, I don't i i wish i had that you know the sort of um very grace graceful relaxed way of being um but i don't have that <laughs> the opposite um so i think what he in you know what he continues to show me is um kind of don't sweat it take a breath it's all doable you know you don't have to convince me of anything you know i'm here i hear you Let's just chill out for a second. <laughs> yeah. Do you think that you guys will work together again? Well, the funny thing is, um, the other day, well, uh, we had, uh, we had, um, I've never applied for a Canada Council grant before, and I did. Um, mm -hmm. And we came together and wrote a, a grant. It's kind of a, um, because we have this methodology. Since making the movie, um, I have a, um, an album of music that Adam and I we're working on before he passed. Uh, I finished the album, and um, and and we really love that album very much. So that that album is being released um, by a great independent label out of Vancouver called Mint Records uh, on April 9th. And so Dylan and I have been um, making music videos for those. And again, because we're still in lockdown, it's the same methodology as the movie. Um, it, in some ways, it's quite these these music videos are very gorgeous. In some ways, uh, they're not as obviously homemade. Um, people watching them go, "Holy, that looks super slick!" Um, so it's there are slick looking stuff. Um, so, so we had, uh, you know, I, I grant grant writing has always been very elusive to me. I don't have the. It seems like you need to have the sort of conceptual art language. I don't know how to do art speak very well. And in fact, there was a point where the Canada Council, in order for you to be qualified as an artist, you had to like go into their portal and kind of like prove that you were an artist. And when I tried to prove I was an artist, I got a, a, uh, a message back saying, I'm sorry, you don't uh, qualify as, as our definition of an artist. <laughs> it's like, 
I spent a, a lifetime doing, and then I said, does it, what about this? I had a solo show at the Ottawa Art Gallery. I've done this, and then they were like, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. Um, and so I thought, okay, maybe me and this grand system aren't gonna, I, maybe they don't really understand what I'm doing. But then I wrote this, uh, this, um, this grant that is kind of, a, it's a kind of um, second part to death and sickness. It's the working title is rest and relax. And it's um, very much a kind of experimental comedy um, rendered in the way that Dylan and I make things. And we kind of sent it off and we put it out of mind. Months later, just this week, like, you know, I think on Thursday, boop, I got an email notification, like the results are in. I'm like, oh God, the results are in, Dylan. Do you want to look at this? He's like, nah. We're like, yeah, real long shot. We're not gonna, we're not gonna get it. Um, just prepare yourself for that. Let's have a have the coffee. You know, a day goes by. Should we look at it now? Okay. And then looked and I was like, oh my God, we got it. Yay. Congrats. Yeah, we got it. And so, so, and I didn't even have to use art speak. It was just a good idea. And so we got it. And then I was like, oh, sh like, it was like, yay. And then I was like, oh man, now we have to make it. Now we have to make it to a deadline. So, so the pressure's on, um, but it's exciting. Cause I think, uh, you know, um, the next year we'll be making, you know, releasing the album. I'm, I'm hoping to perform the music that Adam and I wrote together, made together, recorded Wonderful. together, and then also um, make this movie with Dylan. And then I'm also, um, I have a future movie that is more kind of convent, like like uh, official lines, like with producers and through telefilm and so forth. Um, it's a movie adaptation of uh, the graphic novel, Paying For It by Chester Brown, who's a cartoonist. Um, and I uh, adapted that to a live action movie. And so hopefully the producers can find the financing. And so, you know, it looks like movie and movie making and music are going to be dominating the time in the next um, year or so. Yeah, you have lots of exciting things happening. Um, yeah. Sorry, one sec. I'm going to go through. Um, I was reading. Um, oh, you know what? Before I get to that. Um, I wanted to talk about the end a little bit. Um, you know, was, is that like, a, you know, when the shooting scene, the significance of like a metaphorical death, um, you know, the death of co-dependence, you know, and, and when you leave the house and you're with your mask, mm. um, I kind of feel like a scene from The Walking Dead. I mean, you are the lone survivor, but you have survived and you move forward and it's beautiful, but it's also scary. You know, it feels like the apocalypse. Um, but I thought that was a, a really wonderful way to end it as well. Yes. And I, you know, I don't want it to say, I mean, I love your interpretation. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a, the whole movie is a puzzle, you know, mm -hmm. it, it demands the viewer to bring, bring their, all of their imagination and presence and understanding and critical thinking to it. And so when you say all of those things, you know, to me, all of those aspects resonate, you know, um, there is, a, you know, there's a kind of um, a decision that my character goes through. You know, is she going to capitulate and die? Or is she going to step out into a very unknown world? You know, what do we do? And so it's all, it's, it's a moment that is charged with many things. It's both cathartic and kind of like, um, Kind of uh, uplifting but at the same time when you start hearing all the helicopters <laughs> in the air and the shouting of people yeah and she's still walking towards that it's kind of where we are all at yeah I, I thought that was really really powerful also uh when you're before that is going back to the the plant that was it you said it was a rose um yes. It's a rose. So you're, and then you're unwrapping it, I guess, in, in the end. In the, and I thought that was quite beautiful because it speaks of life and things coming back. And uh, I thought that was quite uh, beautiful to have in there. Yeah, that was really, um, oh. 
Yeah, it, that rose was given to me by Jennifer Castle, who's a beautiful singer. We did not know one another. She's a beautiful musician um, and, and uh, a virtuosic uh, guitarist and just a very, very um, beautiful spirit. I didn't know her, I knew of her music. And then one day after Adam had passed, she shows up and this was a very hard moment where to be quite honest, I did not want to live anymore and could not understand even feel a way forward. And in that moment, she knocked on my door and I opened the door and there she was holding this large rose bush. And she's like, hi, you don't know me, I'm Jennifer. And I just felt compelled to bring this down to you. And I said, please come in. Um, you do not know that you saved me right now. You really, your presence saves me. So happy to see you. And she, the rose is symbolic of uh, rebirth, you know, it's, and it's a plant that is often given when a loved one passes. And to me, this beautiful rose symbolized Adam. And um, it was a strange little rose in that it, it bloomed and then continued to bloom into the winter. And I was like, what is going on? This, this funny little rose. And so to me, it, it really felt like, uh, you know, we don't really understand, I don't think we understand what it is like, I'm looking at you and there's Andrea over there through Zoom and you see me here and people are listening or people are around us wherever. And it, we're raised to really think that um, we're separate beings, separate identities, separate separate um, creatures. And yet I think there's such an undeniable part of us that are that permeates through all all living creatures and um, you and I are very similar. We, you know, we can switch places but, uh, and you, maybe your voice would feel different, but 98% of the way in which you perceive the world would feel the same as you feel over there on your side, very similar. And so I do feel, I, I, I do feel that, um, you know, these, I think we're an in-between technology that doesn't quite understand what is happening but I do think that there's on an energetic level, we are kind of vessels for which life force brings, you know, um, animates and brings to life. And it could be you, it could be me, it could be a rose bush. It could be all, 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 all things. It could be a chair, you know, a, an inanimate object. Um, so this rose to me has become like Adam, a, uh, not only a symbol of Adam, but I do feel um, it, his spirit contained within that as much as my own. So yeah, this uh, this rose becomes you know at first when you see it you're like oh what's that what's that thing in our backyard and then it it, 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 it you kind of see that it it does kind of take on a life of its own. Yeah, I I thought that was that was also really really beautiful. One of the things that I you know I really thought about was um kind of like the dichotomies or opposites that were that were happening um, a lot in in the movie. Um, so, uh, you know, the mundane versus the surreal, the grief versus humor, the boredom versus fear, you know, at times, you know, you just have the real ordinary and then you have the bright light emanating from the fridge and it's kind of like the science fiction alien encounter. <laughs> you know, it's just, you know, and you're communicating with the otherworldly. And so there's that spiritual, and but then there's the real boring, beautiful, but the, I know I shouldn't say boring, but mundane, but it's, but you make the ordinary extraordinary. And so I feel like often there's these opposing forces. And even when I talk about humor, the humor kind of balance, balances the grief in a way, and it makes it more approachable. Absolutely. I mean, the, the humor is the sugar that helps the medicine go down. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been, I've, I've uh, I try to hit, make movies that hit the heart, head and funny bone. And, and have utility that are useful for people, um, but also entertaining. It's really important to me too. So, you know, comedy is very good for that. Um, but it also, it reflects life as I understand it. You know, um, there are moments that are really painful that are also really funny. Um, it's, it's a big hodgepodge of emotions. Uh, in terms of storytelling, and I think in North America, there's more of a, uh, a tendency to stay within a tonal range and um, kind of like, a, um, you know, a genre, a particular stay to stick to a genre, don't mix it up. Whereas European film, European cinema, 
um, the work of the, uh, you know, classic stuff like from, from Fellini. Fellini's movies are very funny and deeply unsettling and sorrowful. Um, uh, um, Bong Jin, Jin Ho, who did Parasite. Uh, I was just speaking with uh, um, Jin Bo Yang, who the editor. And all of the, uh, so many Korean movies are hybrid movies with mercurial emotional shifts. They're dramas, they're scary, they're funny, they're sad, they're uh, banal, they're extraordinary. You know, um, storytelling styles around the world do embrace this. Folk stories oftentimes embrace this. It's just in a kind of like corporate, um, more kind of conventional North American world where they're trying to, I guess they're, they, they're catering to, I guess, um, categories to sell things um but really no one's i mean no one's life is simply sad you know in newfoundland you understand that like you i go there and it's like god even people who are professional comedians feel deeply unfunny when hanging out with newfoundlanders who are extremely funny and and likely because life has been hard and you need to freaking like it's funny like, you know, our hearts are think, funny. I think there is a tradition in Newfoundland with, you know, humor being an access point to talk about difficult things. Yes. Um, and I, and, and, and it works. Yeah, yeah, it, it, um, it feels, um, it feels right to me. And, and when you were saying um, the banal and, you know, when you were making those comments, I was brought back to my childhood and the, the forest behind my house. Uh, which was like a rainforest in a place that I would oftentimes retreat to when things became too difficult at home. I would just run into the forest and immediately feel embraced. Um, and uh, in the forest, I would find very banal things, you know, um, uh, a, a washer, you know, now as an adult, I was like, oh, okay, that was a, a, um, a bolt, a washer. But to my mind, my child mind, it was like uh, this in amazing, beautiful ring, an amulet full of power and incredible that gave me power that you know we, we live in a world of magic as, as children and I don't think that has ever gone for me and I, I I love to see very banal things these days I've been taking a lot of walks in the city and it's the most banal weird corners of the city that really um move me and um there's something very extraordinary in the very very boring or seemingly banal well, I think as artists, there is that kind of relationship that you see things similarly, maybe as a child. And I kind of think of art as a, as a portal to new universes and, you know, the, the imagination is able to create these wonderful new worlds. Um, and I think that's a really beautiful gift about being an artist. Is Very lucky. We're lucky to be able to do that. You know, I have in my family where you know, there's a uh, legacy of trauma and difficulty. You can see it being worked through generations. Half of my family are repressors and half of them are emoters. <laughs> half of them get drunk real fast, one beer, half of them can hold their liquor. The repressors and the, the ones who are able to hold their liquor are the same. Me, I can't drink a beer without getting drunk and I'm a huge emoter and I tend to like, try to figure, like, be overwhelmed by something and try to work with it. Whereas my sisters are like, why? <laughs> I think um, I've been lucky that way because I, I do feel that, that it helps me work through certain things and it helps me not carry the stress. Um, I was reading uh, an article, uh, I, was, uh, I don't know if Jen interviewed you from She Does the City mm -hmm. and, um, I think you had said that art saved your life. And I think this really also resonated for me personally as an artist, because it's always been an anchor. And I think sometimes it's really helped me get through difficult times. Um, and so as a way of processing things, but it's just, you know, having that. Um, so has this film changed you? And in a way, did it save your life? Yes. Um this movie um, allowed me to have an arena by which to consider, dramatize, reflect upon tremendous losses and loves and how to sustain the love in the face of what seems to be an ending, how to let go and, and, and hold dear. 
um, it's offered me clues. You know, I think sometimes our heart, our higher selves operate through our work and sometimes our dreams as well. I still feel kind of like completely confounded and, and deeply flawed. Um, I'm still wrestling with this. It's, it's, it's tremendously difficult. Um, life without Adam is very challenging. Um, but uh, I have through the work, a conversation with him and with myself in terms of how, how, how to abide to this, because that is life. You know, I cannot continue to reject this because it will happen more and more, you know, and then until the moment that I had, that I pass as well, that we will all confront. So how to make peace with that. I, th I think it's um, a kind of, it seems to me a very important passage in everybody's life to, tr to try to take some time to kind of um, not necessarily even make peace, but kind of sh shake hands with that thing that is somewhat unknown and scary, mm -hmm. off-putting, discombobulating. Um, see, see it, feel it, perhaps demystify it and deconstruct it. Um, so it has offered me a, a space to consider these things. I, like it, I think it feels like a wonderful journey and a complicated journey, but there's this wonderful searching that you go that you as a as a viewer I experience and I really appreciated that. You know, I think that um the um when I'm working on this music that I'll, Adam and I were making, it make fills me with I love it so much. You know, I love it so much and I feel his spirit in the music. I can hear it and I can't wait to share it because I can't wait for people to hear his spirit in the song in the same way as I feel they can feel the spirit of Adam and my sister and Malka in and me and, and Dylan in the work and other people and the world and themselves, because hopefully they can identify with what we're doing um, because it's a very universal story. Um, at the same time, having to like the other day, I was doing an interview about the album with somebody and I was just like, it was hard. Some of the questions were extremely difficult and I, I'm like, oh shit! I'm I'm up for I'm have to I'll have to do a bunch of interviews, so I it didn't. I, I was I was thankful for that process because it made me realize, oh boy, you're gonna have to figure out what you will and will not talk, speak about because it's if you have to do it's like kind of hurt hurtful every every moment having to rummage up these things. So like finding that balance, you know, between what lifts me. And is difficult, but then also something that I can cope with and stuff that is, to, to, I can just, it's hard. You know, to be honest, there are times going through, um, going through certain scenes that was very tremendously hard as an actor. You know, it took a great deal to like take a moment and breathe and cry and work through that. And I, I, I sense that as, as a viewer, you know, I, and I thought, I, I, think it's amazing that you're able to go there and the courage um, to be able and to be able to do that. I think it's, it's tremendous. Um, and it's, and it's so emotive watching it, you know, as it goes through, it's very visceral. It goes through your entire body. You know, that's the other thing about doing movies in such a small way, literally so much of the movie, like when Dylan and I are having a conversation, I would have to say, Dylan, just, Pretend it's my face, but just look at the camera here. So like we were acting with objects. Um, so in my, many, like in that, a few of the scenes I just shot myself, you know, when he, he, was, he wasn't around. So it's almost that thing of being alone and you forget that you're, so it's the idea of bravery or courage. I never felt that, I feel like a big scaredy cat. And some people have, all, have said, you know, you're so brave and courageous. I have always, always feel like maybe either possibly guileless and um, not realizing exactly what it is. But there was something in this kind of little bubble where you just talk, like it, imagine you just, you're, you're, you're by yourself and you're, you know, just, it's not like people doing selfies, right? There's a kind of like, kind of openness that you have when you're alone. Um, that could only be rendered in a kind of very intimate process like this filmmaking with two people as the cast and crew. 
Well, I, I, I just, I think it was really, really magnificent and wonderful. And I thank you again for, for sharing it with the world. Um, oh, so I, it makes me happy. You know, I, I, uh, I didn't know. I, I was like, oh man, people are going to get, we're really weirded out by this. I didn't, um, I didn't find that at all. <laughs> it's been very heartening. Um, a lot of people really love it. You know, my sister, my little sister, she's, um, she's also an artist and she's seen all of my work and she was like also very moved. And she said, so can I think this is your best work, which is very funny. Cause it's like super low budge and, you know, done, you know, conceived and made within a half a year. So it's kind of something was coming together in this process um, that uh, painted the, and you could only hope as an artist, I can only hope to, to move people um, to feel something, to reflect upon their own lives. And for that, I am so grateful and, um, and happy for, with this, this piece. Um, and it's uh, given me a kind of gauge again. It's um, um, put me back on track into you know, what to strive for, what to hope for, what to set out to create. Um, and it's also given me, you know, I, I began it as, as an artist and then I dovetailed into media much music and CBC. I, as I said, I see those aspects of art disciplines and expressive disciplines. But now I feel like in this chapter of my life, a, a return to art, art and a, a, a return to the commitment of that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so it's pretty exciting. It's very exciting. I, I, I'm so glad that you that, that, that you felt something. It makes oh me. Gosh, happy. Boy, did I ever! And I, you know, I'm really excited to see what you you do next. I can't wait. Yeah. What, what about you? You know, you're making stuff too as well. Yeah, I make, I've always made experimental uh, media art. So video art, uh, you know, um, I just made a piece called Mammoth and it was about aging and sexuality. And I go from being a woolly mammoth in the landscape to uh, not in a costume, but just, you know, a wig. And then uh, I go to being a sex robot. So I created sparkly <laughs> air filters and created an augmented, you know, version of myself and yeah. Oh, wow, that sounds amazing. So uh, yeah, all my work has been pretty experimental, and, yeah, and it uh, sounds like it's going to very deep places as well, hard places. Yeah, yeah it, it does. It all it, it does. You know, it's also about climate change um, and you know the beginning and the end of the world, but also you know what sexuality and aging and isolation and being left alone. So it does uh, deal with all those difficult things. Hurrah! <laughs> we need to hear that. Yes, we do. We, you know, I, th I think sometimes we don't, uh, people don't go there and uh, go to the dark places or the hard places. Um, and I think it's important to have difficult conversations in art and challenge people. Um, it's important. It is, you know, I mean, I, I, there's, there is the art that is the opposite of that. Yeah, there and, is. And I find that sometimes that stuff kind of it moves me in a deeply upsetting way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, it pushes me too, that, that other stuff. 